We rewrote this article a few years ago, and it just kind of highlights uh, the antiviral discovery and the antiretroviral discovery over the last um, basically 40 years. Um, and basically, we all know in this room uh, that there was very little done in antiviral discovery um, in, in history because it's a very difficult thing to do. If you look at uh, bacteria, all bacteria have a very similar replication scheme, and they all have very similar targets. So you make one antibiotic, and typically it works against all uh, other bacteria. With viruses, every virus is developed differently. It evolves from different hosts. It steals things from the host. It's a non-living entity. And as a consequence, the targets are varied. And in addition, because all of those proteins, everything the virus has, has been stolen from the host, it's very easy to get a lot of side effects and a lot of secondary events that are related to host um, toxicity. So antiviral discovery is probably one of the hardest things we do in drug discovery. And so as a consequence, um, a lot of the drugs that were discovered early in the 60s are sometimes still used today, and we didn't even know how they worked. Uh, examples are romantidine and amantadine. And now, with the new developments that we have, um, specifically looking at the actual protein structure, we can design and make designer drugs that target these uh, proteins in viruses. So what I like to show here, and I can't really show it visually, is um, you know, there's a steady rate of antiviral drug discovery on the bottom in the black. And what you can see is this incredible burst of antiretroviral drug discovery uh, starting in the early 90s, and then with triple combination, more and more drugs coming on board. But if you can kind of notice, uh, starting in around 2010 and 11, we're coming down on that curve. And unfortunately, it's not going back up. So the most latest drugs that um, were, have been approved are things like Maraviroc, Adolutegravir, Raltegravir. These are drugs um, that are very potent, very effective. Well, a question mark about Maraviroc. But um, basically, it's now pretty well established in pharma industry that we have the arsenal that we need, which is interesting because I recently was at a... Um, a symposium very similar to this for AMFAR about two weeks ago. And the symposium was all about cure. So how are we going to cure HIV? How are we going to take the patients, many of you that are in this room, and uh, basically kill off the virus so you no longer have to be on drugs? And um, most of the community that was in that room didn't care about cure. What they really cared about was, I've been infected for 30 years. I've been through the whole drug arsenal. What's coming next? And the sad thing really is not a whole lot. So next slide, please. Oh, that, that's, that would be me. <laughs> so I kind of outlined here, and you can't really read it. And that's not really necessary. But pretty well everything in bold text at the bottom in the different colors are the approved antiretroviral drugs that we have in our treatment arsenal. And many of you know that we use combinations of three of these drugs now, typically, to block HIV. And in uh, the lighter text at the bottom were drugs that were in development. Um, but unfortunately, a lot of these drugs have just been stopped. It's sometimes in early phase one, phase two clinical trials. Example was Bevirimat, which was you know, a potentially successful drug and just never really moved beyond phase one, phase two trials. Um, and there's just not a lot of impetus. Uh, pharma companies now, and I'm not criticizing them in some ways, but they're much more focused on anti-hepatitis uh, C drugs um, because really that's where the market is. If you look at HIV, uh, when you have this many drugs, um, except for the small proportion of the HIV-infected population that has been infected for 20 or 30 years, the market just isn't there anymore. So there's no market pressure to develop those drugs anymore. Um, I'm not showing this. I'm, this is just fancy, pretty pictures. And it just kind of shows you, again, how specific and how 
uh, designer some of these drugs are in, in how they can bind to the viral enzymes. And here are nucleoside RT inhibitors. And some of those were discovered very early on and not in relation to even HIV. Uh, these are things that bind very specifically our non-nucleoside RT inhibitors, the Favrins, the Laverdine, um, Nevirapine. And then we have our whole host of protease inhibitors and integrase inhibitors, if anybody wants to know, and entry inhibitors. But the point I'm trying to make, and it's a sad point and makes it an easy talk in some ways, is we don't have a lot that's newly developed. Um, I'm just going to go through, skip through this because uh, I already have one minute left. Um, but this is just to show you um, how we make mistakes in treatment. And uh, if anything we learn from our mistakes is that we can repeat those mistakes perfectly the next time. Um, and uh, hepatitis C might be a classic example of that. So every company wants their miracle drug. They want to be the only drug to be utilized in monotherapy so that it's effective and they can make all the profits. And as we know in HIV, we quickly discovered that that doesn't work and that we need a combination of at least three drugs in order to effectively treat HIV. And we made those mistakes by going through monotherapy, dual therapy, ineffective triple combination therapy, more effective triple combination therapy, and some might argue that the less effective triple combination therapy, well, now we're giving that mostly to patients in Africa. And the best triple combination therapy we're reserving for ourselves. Um, with the last couple of slides, what I want to say is resistance does occur to all of these treatments. Why does it occur? Um, mostly because patients are non-adherent to their ARVs. That might sound like a very critical statement, but it's true. I mean, if I, I can't even finish a course of antibiotic treatment, and that's only two weeks. So you can imagine uh, people in this room that have to take their antiretroviral drugs for their entirety of their life. You go on a holiday even for a month, you can develop resistance quite rapidly. Sometimes you have some spontaneous mutations, and sometimes you just are un unlucky and get infected with a resistant virus. Now, the interesting thing is just this simple math that explains why three drugs work as compared to two and one. So we're making about 10 to the 9 particles a day, incredible volumes of virus. Most of that is controlled and um, basically killed by the immune system. You're making a mutation out of one out of every 1,000 to 10,000 nucleotides bases, building blocks of the HIV uh, virus. And that virus is only about 10,000 bases long. What that amounts to is basically every pre-existing drug-resistant virus in, is in your system every single day, 100 times over. So you treat with one drug, it takes a matter of two or three days to develop resistance to that one drug. That's a lesson I think it's not very really well understood yet in hepatitis C treatment, and I'm afraid that they might learn that lesson difficult. Um, now, you treat with two drugs, not every combination of two drugs can, mutations to those two drugs are apparent at a high level. So it's only about maybe 10 viruses in your body that have every combination of two mutations, but that drug resistance pre-exists prior to treatment. So you treat with two drugs, resistance comes up. Where the math fails us is not every combination of three mutations can appear in a virus, in a patient, prior to treatment. Just barely, okay? So we're just sitting on the borderline of math there. And that's why three drugs so work so effectively. Now, what happens if you stop taking one of your drugs in your triple combination therapy? You develop one drug resistant, two will come along as passengers, and you'll fail your treatment.